Hi everyone, today we are joined by Vivica and I'm going to introduce her in a second but she is here to talk to us all about thyroid because I get so many questions about thyroid imbalances, on low carb, eating high fat, on high carb, so we want to break it all down for you today and give you information about your thyroid for women because there's a lot of information out there but it's not specific to women and we are both women who know a little bit about thyroid, so let's get right into it. Vivica is a certified technician in whole nutrition with four years of clinical practice. Originally from Italy, she grew up in a family of restaurateurs, learned to cook from professional chefs, and soon discovered her passion for food. After moving to the U.S., Vivica had a successful career as a food photographer and then decided to study nutrition, her true vocation. Vivica now lives in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada with her husband and many spoiled pets. And like, there are a lot of pets. <laughs> Last year, she opened her own web-based practice specializing in therapeutic ketogenic diets. Vivica is also the creator of the Healing Foods Method, a 10-week course to transform health and lifestyle with a focus on metabolism and endocrine rebalancing. Vivica's blog, The Nourished Caveman, is filled with delicious keto paleo recipes with lots of useful information. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's so exciting. It's yeah, awesome. and we're kind of matching a little bit, like we're channeling the white. <laughs> I know. Okay, so I did a little bit of introduction and I want to just jump right into it unless you want to say something before because we have a lot of questions. No, let's go ahead. Let's do it. Okay, so I paneled the Healthful Pursuit re a reader and the readers rather and our community and they had a bunch of questions and I thought we'd do like a good introduction to the thyroid gland overall. So can you tell us a little bit about what the thyroid is for people that don't know? Okay, so the thyroid, it's located right here, first of all, and you can actually feel your own thyroid when you swallow. If you go like this, Dude. you feel a little <laughs> movement inside, like wah, wah, it goes up and down. So that's a really good thing to like locate your thyroid, know what it is, get familiar with it. But we call it the master gland because the thyroid is really like the main gland of the endocrine system. It's a regulator and thyroid hormones have effect on like a lot of different bodily functions. So it's not, you know, if you look, there is a thing called the Harrower's chart, which is uh, from Dr. Harrower and is a chart of endocrine connections. So it shows you all the interdependence of the endocrine system and it shows you all the connections between like all the different glands and how the suppressors stimulate each other. And the thyroid is one of the ones that you really see. It's like has the most connections and really is tied in like in the center of the endocrine system. Sometimes, I don't know, I was talking to a patient with this like metaphor yesterday it was really kind of funny like you know nutrition is your journey you start to climb like Mount Everest and then you're going up this mountain and you're working on all the different things on the pillars of nutrition digestion detoxing blah 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 and then you reach the top of the mountain and then sits a golden temple in the shape of a thyroid <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which is good visual to like give you the importance of the thyroid in the body. <laughs> yes, it's so true. And so many issues stem from the thyroid imbalance. Yes. Although and the thyroid sits on top, that means that it really like, you know, one of, I'm jumping ahead here a bit, but you know, one of the main issues that we face nowadays is trying to fix the thyroid without fixing everything else it rests upon. Because the thyroid is kind of really the pinnacle and the controller, but in order for it to function properly, we need to address all the other underlying factors that determine thyroid health. So you're saying that hypothetically, if somebody has a low thyroid, chances are if their thyroid is low, there's a lot of other things going on and you need to fix all those other things before or during the time that you're fixing your thyroid. Would that be fair to say? Yes, most definitely. And so what hormone specifically is the thyroid related to? Like you hear a lot about the thyroid can impact the adrenals, which produces cortisol. And, and so how is that connection? 
put together? Um, the hormone, the thyroid itself produces like the main hormones are T4 that then gets converted into T3 and then also like it's about um, 90% T4 production and 10% T3. T3 is the active form of T4. Um, it's quite complex. Actually, the workings of the thyroid are quite complex and like I'm still like always putting it all together. It's like a really complicated puzzle, but that's our physiology in the end, <laughs> you know. So it also produces like there is reverse T3 and then T2 um, calcitonin is also produced that affects calcium levels. And I hope I'm not saying something wrong here. But, um, and then if we go look at how, um, if you wanna look at the relationship with the adrenals and the thyroid, they're kind of like, sometimes we call them two hands, two ends of the same stick. So it's like you have adrenals and thyroid and you cannot really move the stick without sending one out of balance. Mm -hmm. So there is this really strong connection. And I like another analogy even better, which is the pyramid. And so you have adrenals on one corner and ovaries or gonads on the other corner and then the thyroid sits on top. So in order to achieve the balance, everything has to be stable and solid, you know, but also it's a great analogy for a practitioner because it really explains you how you need to start addressing adrenal and sex hormones before you can work with the thyroid directly. And you can support the thyroid, but, you know, without doing the other work before, it's really kind of useless. I always say in my practice with that triangle that you said, it's like a three-legged stool. And when you kick one leg out, it just falls over. Like, That's you can't great. make it work. So there's an, another analogy for I your like practice. Um, so what are the <laughs> symptoms? Yeah, woo! <laughs> and that's often what happens. So what are the symptoms of thyroid imbalance? And how, how would somebody know, like, if somebody's watching this, I'm thinking a woman is watching this and thinking, okay, so I know what the thyroid is, but how do I know if it's imbalanced? Well, especially for women, and I would say in my case, very closely related to myself, for women over 40, which are the most likely to start developing thyroid problems, mm -hmm. one of the main things you notice is the weight gain. So it starts with like really noticing that you've gained a bunch of weight and you can't lose it no matter what you're doing. Of course, that there is also a metabolic pathway involved in that. And, you know, like I'm big on ketogenic diet because a lot of people have carbohydrate intolerance and that is involved in that weight gain. But again, if you go around to the other side, so it is related to the thyroid through the carb intolerance as well, because when you're carb intolerant, then you stress your adrenals because your cortisol has to regulate your sugar levels all the time. So you're constantly putting that stress on the adrenals. Your blood sugar is going, you know, up and down like crazy, like a roller coaster. And so that stresses the adrenals. And when the adrenals are stressed, the thyroid start toppling over that stool. So again, um, the weight loss is connected in both ways, so metabolic pathway and then directly to like hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. Then there are things like depression, that's another really big one. Uh, when you like the blues, the constant blues, not being able to get one, that's easily solved with some Prozac, right? Depression is a Prozac deficiency. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so another symptom is like cold hands and feet especially hands and feet, but just this general feeling of being cold and not being able to warm up and having like, you like to sit in the sun like a lizard, you're never sweating. Uh, by the way, one little tidbit of information that I learned not kind of recently, when you know certain people don't sweat? Yes. And they're like, why I don't sweat? I can't sweat. Well, guess what? That's an iodine, iodine deficiency. That's really interesting that you say that because I started supplementing with iodine about four months ago, like in May. And I was kind of like, I sweat, but never crazily. Like I'd go to hot yoga and like maybe I'd get a couple drips. The last couple of weeks, I am like drenched in sweat, drenched. And I was like, what is going on in yoga, in my sauna? Okay. That's fantastic. Interesting. Interesting. Yep. 
Thank uh, you for reconfirming that. <laughs> that is so cool. And I couldn't put the two together. So thank you for confirming it for me. So what are the causes like we, we what are the causes of a thyroid imbalance? I know that I've heard like especially here um, in Canada, in our city, we actually got our fluoride and uh, fluoride taken away from our water. Thank goodness. Oh, really? They yeah, did? they took it out. Um, but I've also heard that chloride and bromide, like these are the three that affect our thyroid. Are there other things or how, how do those halogens. items take? Sorry? Yeah, halogens. Okay. And halogens are directly related to iodine deficiency because what happens when you're deficient in iodine, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the thyroid really needs iodine. Iodine and iodide in like it's basically iodine in the both forms of iodine and iodide um, goes into the thyroid and is basically one of the pieces of the T3 and T4 hormones. So without T3, without iodine and iodide, T3 and T4 are not created in the thyroid. Mm. And we are all really iodine deficient. So especially if you don't live by the ocean, you're not eating fish every day, you don't eat seaweed, um, you live inland, your, your the soil is iodine deficient. So in America, there is one thing called the goiter belt. It's this area where everybody has goiters, and that's because the soil is iodine deficient, and it's inland. So by the, the thyroid being iodine deficient, then it is prone to absorb other halogens just because it's like, I really need this. Oh. It's not available. Okay, this looks almost similar. Like, let's put it in. You know, oh, interesting. So molecularly, all the halogens are very similar. I think they're just like one, like, you know, atomic composition difference, like very, very slight difference. But the iodine is the healthy halogen, while the chlorine or fluorine, fluoride, chloride is actually not as bad for some reason. It seems to be present in nature. It's not as toxic. But bromide and bromine, and fluoride and fluorine and chlorine, those are really, all really, really toxic. So as a girl who has a hot tub, because she thought it was a good idea when she was a runner, <laughs> I never go in that thing anymore. But for people that are swimmers or going to the hot tub, you yeah. would think that, like I take a lot of my medicine and supplements on my skin. So by sitting in a hot tub with all that stuff, yeah, that is what you're, th you're, you're soaking up those yep. things into yep. your skin and into your body. So um, Absolutely. just a but heads up. Is, the good news is that there is a way to prevent this from happening. And that is doing iodine loading. So saturating your body with the iodine it needs. And then once your body is iodine saturated, you don't absorb, you don't need the halogens anymore. So they'll just bounce off of you pretty much. And the, is, is the, the test with the two inches of iodine on your skin to see whether or not it soaks in, is that a good test? Mm -hmm. I've read that, but I, I no. don't know. I, Unfortunately, what happens is like the test is very unreliable because about 60% of the iodine evaporates within the first minute, depending on room temperature. So if the room is over like, I don't know, 70 degrees, then like most of the iodine just evaporates. So you would have to have like very clinically controlled environment in order for, you know, this to be a reliable test and that doesn't happen. What is really good for iodine tests, there are two kinds of iodine tests. Um, one is a 24 hour iodine loading test and is done with multiple samples of urine. And then the other one is just a one sample urine loading test that you do with like, you, you get iodine at night and then you pee in the morning and they sample it. The other one, they just load you up with like, I don't know, more 150 milligrams or depending on the lab is different. But, and then they test you within 24 hours. You have to collect urine samples within 24 hours and put them all together and send them in. So since we're on the iodine topic, something kind of related to this, I guess to summarize what you've said so far is that iodine is like the super nutrient for our thyroid. I think that's fair to say. Um, I started taking iodine, like I said, but over the last, I would say a week, I've been getting like lower gut pains every time I eat them or have my iodine drops. Do you know why that could be or if you've heard of something like that before? Not to put you on the spot, I was just curious. No, yeah, I, the first thing that comes to my mind, it can be a detoxing reaction. 
Mm-hmm. And when you start taking iodine, and iodine is like a whole other topic that's a huge topic, and there is lots of controversy about it, but I love this topic, and I'm happy to talk about it. But um, you can start detoxing from halogens at any time. So to really load your body with iodine, it takes about a year to three years. It's not a quick process. And this is a doses of like 15 to 50 milligrams, not microgram, milligrams per day, you know, which is also something that for people with Hashimoto's would not be recommended. I would do it in a very different way. But... um, if, let's say you don't have Shimoto's and you just have thyroid issues, hypo, primary hypothyroidism, and you want to do iodine loading, keep in mind, if you don't do it with a practitioner, that at any point in time, you can start getting into a pocket of toxicity as your glands your and your tissues saturate. Your iodine is stored in the thyroid, is stored in the breast tissue mostly, and is stored in the skin too at some level, you know, a bit less. But, for example, there has been cases of people that after three, four months started oozing, like, bright yellow stuff out of their breast. I'd freak out. (laughs) Fluoride, fluorine coming out from their breast tissue. In fact, that's one of the reasons why iodine is one of the most amazing cancer preventative because it will keep that breast tissue saturated and healthy so that nothing bad will go in there. And also, it's really protective for the cells. It enables the cells to work at the best efficiency level so that it's great prevention. Okay, so what you're saying is put some more iodine in my water tomorrow and just, yeah, it was just weird, like lower gut pain. And I'm like, what is going on? I wouldn't add more. Oh, no, I stopped taking it like a couple days ago because I was like, this is brutal. So get back to to doing that. Maybe pull your dose in half. Okay, good to know. Whenever that happens, I would pull back the dose and just take it easy, but go steady because you need to come through that detox part. So that you can clean up and load and then keep going. You I know? had no idea. Okay, that makes sense. So now getting to like low carb diets and ketogenic because we're both keto girls. And what is the what is the are there risks to the to um, doing a ketogenic eating style and your thyroid? Like you hear a lot about uh, ketogenic eating styles maybe not being so good for the mm-hmm. thyroid or eating low carb not being good for the thyroid so can you talk a little bit about your experience with that yeah um first of all i really don't think it is true but then again we need to do a bunch of consideration about that statement so i don't work with just random ketogenic diet I work with the therapeutic ketogenic diet so that means that I work with the elimination diet as well my ketogenic diet is paleo mostly I would say 90% paleo Um, I check and test for allergens and sensitivities that connects me back to the staples the pillars that support the thyroid right because one of those pillars is gut health and digestion so, for example, if you have sensitivities that, like dairy, for example, you know, pork, eggs, could be anything. Grains, not really, because we don't do them on keto. <laughs> so, there's one less thing to worry about. Yeah, right? true. But when you have a leaky gut and you have that dairy protein leaking in, um, it starts a whole chain reaction. You will not be able to absorb the right nutrients that the thyroid needs when your gut is not functioning and your upper digestion also, you know, not enough HCL. So the whole digestive system and the balance of digestion is really related to thyroid health. It's one of the bases. So if you're not doing a therapeutic diet, just a random ketogenic diet where you say, okay, I'm going to McDonald's, but I'm eating keto macros, which is possible. Oh, totally. Some people do it. But yes, really, I, I've, I right. have met those people. <laughs> right. So that, it wouldn't be good for the thyroid, for sure. But as far as just like, if we just talked about a clean therapeutic ketogenic diet and like the carb restriction, I have to say that women have different carb needs than men. And especially women of a certain age, like when you're 20, is very different than when you're 40 or 50 or 60. 
So for women, I feel that what works the best, like, and remember, we talked about it in our first chats, yeah, we did. chats before about, you know, ideal carb levels. And I find more and more that what I do, I use a very low level of carbs for keto adaptation, like 20 grams. But once we are properly keto adapted, then I tend to raise them depending on the situation and the metabolism. So unless you are, you know, if you're a woman and let's say a woman over 30, unless your problem is strictly metabolic and let's say you have diabetes, but you, your adrenals are fine, your thyroid is fine, endocrine system seems to work fine. It's possible, not common, but possible. <laughs> Right. I've never seen, I've never met with anyone who has that profile. One. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> She's Canadian, by the oh, way. Oh, yes. Yeah. Represent. <laughs> so unless it's that very rare and specific situation where I would say, okay, you know, pancreas is our main focus, carb intolerance super high, you know, insulin resistance super high, then we need to keep the carbs really low and controlled. But otherwise, I think that it is healthier to try to bring up the carbs to the highest, I mean, the sensitivity level. So where we can do the highest level of carbs for your tolerance. So it might be 50 grams a day, it might be 60, it might be 90 for some people, you know. if You can reset a lot of your insulin resistance by doing, you know, strictly low carb. And there are a lot of techniques for that specifically. But once you're not so insulin resistant and you start to be insulin sensitive, then you can have more carbs. Of course, good carbs, right? Like lately I've been prescribing my patients my new recipe for keto bagels. And they're just like super fiber, like they're called the column cleanser. Yeah, <laughs> get things fiber. moving. But they're very high fiber and mostly higher carbs than what a regular keto food would be. Mm. But they're, they're really good carb. And when you're on ketos, you need that fiber desperately. So it seems like one of the little tricks that I use to like raise carbs without having them like fall into things like potatoes or, you know, rice. Don't do rice. <laughs> Even white rice, you would say don't do white rice. Mm, I prefer not. Okay, yeah. It might just be a personal stigma, but, you know, rice, white rice doesn't have a lot of nutrition. No, I, so, I totally agree. The only the only reason I don't eat rice is because I can't stop eating rice. Like, I, it's like an empty, like, it makes me want more rice and rice and rice. And I have some clients that they enjoy sure. having white rice. and But it's like, yeah, at the end of the day, you're not really filling up your plate. Like, there's, there's not a lot of nutrients there. Right. Yeah, that's why... For fiber, like, and not fiber, but carb and fiber together, which is, you know, fiber is part of the carbs. But um, I like to use things more like, like seeds that are nutritious, and usually they're quite neutral in a way. So they seem, although I see that in my patient, I see over and over that not everybody is sensitive to the same things. You know, some people will do great with like psyllium or will do great with chia and they will do horrible with like flax seeds and some people is the opposite. So it's really like see over and over that you can't make a general statement when it comes to diet and what works for your body individually. You kind of have to really play and and see what works for you. Totally. You know? I love that you mentioned that carb depletion and then increasing carbs. In fact, with my new book, Fat Fueled, I have like three different profiles that I've done for people saying like, do this, but then yeah, find that tolerance and go as high as you can go because you will become more sensitive. And then it makes it a lot yes. easier. Like I used to be able, I would fall asleep at anything over 80 grams of carbs like I would eat carbs and then just pass out but now I can do 80 grams of carbs no problem and it's no big deal so it's amazing to see how your body changes with time and is it fair to say that there are some hormones that the thyroid is responsible that need carbohydrates in order to convert I'm not sure I, I honestly like for the kind of endocrinology that I do which is functional endocrinology I have never seen a direct correlation okay. Okay. between, you know, it's not talked about. And I don't know, like there, I know there is a lot of talk of that out there and also in like functional medicine, but the kind of nutrition I do is a little bit different 
because you know it's um, I don't know what you would even call it it's like foundation on nutrition we only use whole food supplements I don't use the isolates like the functional medicine doctors do so we're a little bit on two different steps so sometimes there are like like you know for example the iodine that's a big discrepancy because functional medicine doctors tell you no iodine at all for Hashimoto's and I use iodine for Hashimoto's. I use it very, very carefully and in small dosages, but yes, I do. So, you know, the same with the carbs. It's like different opinions and different things. It's so true. And at the end of the day, you just have to try, like try some things. And if you don't feel good, then you know that that's not working. And how do you shift that? And that's kind of, that's why we're both here. That's why we do what we do. Because sometimes when you're in the heat of it, it's hard to determine what you need to do personally. And to have a coach or something being like, okay, well, have you tried this and that? And I saw this with this other client. Have you tried this? It brings a lot more into perspective because I know even for myself, like I have a coach because sometimes I'm just like, I don't even know what, right. what is making me do this because you're right in the heat of it. Um, Absolutely. So for people that, you know, that are listening, women especially that are listening, that sit, that know that they have a thyroid condition, maybe they have hypothyroid or Hashimoto's, uh, if they wanted to try a ketogenic and our approach, which I believe that my approach too is very therapeutic like yours. If we wanted to go toward a ketogenic eating style, like you mentioned before, I guess it's just like do the therapeutic kind. If you know that you have a thyroid imbalance or any imbalance with your health, do more of a therapeutic form of ketogenic eating as opposed to like the sausages with the eggs and, you know, conventional eggs with the cheese and the sour cream on your plate. Exactly. Right. Yeah, is that fair? I'm so glad that you share my same point. Of yeah. View. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think like I love having I love having people on um on the show to talk about health and stuff, and I love when we don't agree with things. But I also want to make sure that uh, I'm responsible for sharing this information with people, and I want to make sure you, my guests aren't saying, "Yeah, totally, it's fine to have conventional meat," because I don't think that that's uh, responsible of me to have a guest on there that just I, I can't agree with with the the recommendations that they're giving. So. Um, yeah, I'm happy that we agree on that. Um, uh, in your introduction, we mentioned that you focus on rebalance, rebalancing endocrine systems. So what are five steps that uh, listeners or watchers could do right now to balance out their thyroid? Maybe they're interested in ketogenic eating style. Maybe they're already doing it. Are there a couple steps that you would recommend doing? Um, yeah, and it's kind of like the steps that I use in my practice to achieve that, I got to tell you, it's not always easy to do it by yourself, but if you're up for it, go for it. You know, you can always try. And then if you fail, call us. <laughs> yeah. We're still here, right? Yeah. And Vivica will help you. Yeah. <laughs> but I was definitely start from um, cleaning up your act, <laughs> cleaning up your diet, uh, eliminating possible food sensitivities. So going dairy free sometimes really helps. I egg and, eggs and pork I eliminate when I do a detox phase, but you know you really could try to eat as clean as possible. Definitely eliminating toxins. I always do a detox on my patients when they start my program. Even if they don't do the program, I do individual consults. I try to make them do a detox because it's kind of the basis for nutrition. So cleaning out, avoiding allergens, and supporting your liver, that's all kind of like one step for me. And then we'll go, step two would be digestion, you know, of course, and making sure that your digestion is working. So upper digestion, um, maybe HCL supplements that can help you break down that protein that is otherwise going through and proper it will digest for you it's not ideal there is other things that are better when you get into really fine-tuning digestion but at least that will do the job so that you don't get partially digested protein through your digestive system which is really bad then of course lower digestion probiotics and you know eating a good amount fermented foods are great you know cultivate the microbiota so digestion is second adrenal health is third we know how important that is. I, yeah, I, like, cur my, my, my smile <laughs> curled up when you said that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those adrenals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the wall of our generation or our time because we're all way too stressed 
and way too busy and way too many demands on our time and on ourselves. So adrenals meaning stress management and adrenal support. And yes, people, adrenal fatigue does exist. Come on, get real. Uh, right? <laughs> like, how could you not think that it doesn't? Because conventional endocrinology, I'm sorry I'm going to say this, forgive me all out there, but it's in the Middle Ages. Like, it's in the Dark Ages. Really, conventional endocrinology is like, has a blinder on. So, anyways, uh, that's adrenal support. And then I would do definitely gonads, so meaning sex hormone support. Make sure that your sex hormones are balanced and that that's a very other tricky. See, that's why I tell you working with the thyroid, it's like it's not easy and it's it's a complicated picture and you really do have to address all these pieces of the puzzle. So that is one and you know again I do this um, it's called restorative endocrinology or functional endocrinology but I just work with rebalancing naturally the hormones I don't use bioidenticals um, not even you know the safest drop sublinguals I don't use any of that I try to do it naturally but I use herbal supplements and whole food supplements so if that is kind of hard to do by yourself unless you really know what you're doing. I would suggest working with a practitioner. Saliva tests are great for that, you know. Also, saliva test is great for the adrenals. There is one called the Adrenal Stress Index, ASI test. That's a great one to see your cortisol pattern so you can have a better idea. And by the way, there are websites in the United States where you can order those tests yourself. That's you might not amazing. want to read it. But you don't even need to go and beg your doctors. Good, but doctors have been such pains. <laughs> oh, so many of my clients are just like, I give them a list of blood work to get, and their doctor's like, no, you don't need this. And it's right? obvious that they have a thyroid issue, and I, we just want to know, where's their thyroid at? What, what is their cortisol level? What, you know, what are their adrenals doing? What are their sex hormones? Like the, the stool, just to see, like that three-legged stool, what's going on? And they're like, no, you don't need that. And it's like... No. And are you, you kidding me? Your head against the wall. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because then a lot of people will say, "Oh, you know, well, my doctor said that it's not a problem." Well, like, find a new doctor, really. I <laughs> just like it's your body, it's your health, and at the end of the day, they're not responsible really for how you feel. You are. So if you don't feel good, you got to do something about it. So it's awesome that they have those tests in the U.S. Yeah. Now it just needs to come yeah. up north to Canada. <laughs> I think you can order them for Canada. Really? Um, okay. I can I'll send have to... you a link for a site that you can just order tests privately, and they have international um, locations. I know they have in Europe, so maybe also for Canada. I'll send you a link. Cool. I will add that to the show notes below so that everyone can uh, check it out if it's something that resonates with them. So I... I chatted with my community and I have a bunch of like rapid fire questions for both of us. If, if you can't answer, I'll answer it. If I can't answer, oh, wait, you answer. You forgot real quick the, the last thing, the fifth. You know, oh my step. gosh, I thought you did five. Do it. And that's passed by thyroid support. Now, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so the nutrients that the thyroid need, which are like, you know, vitamin C, vitamin D, iron, and um, of course, iodine. So all the good stuff that the thyroid needs to function. And protein, because without thyroglobulin, nothing gets made. So if you can't break up down that protein in your stomach and your thyroid doesn't get the protein to make, you know, the, the hormones, then you don't have the raw material. So and that goes back up to digestive health, because if you don't have the hydrochloric acid, you're not bringing down the protein, and it's like a whole exactly. mesh. Yeah. Like yeah. untangling spaghetti. <laughs> 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 yeah, we'll take one piece at a time. Okay, yeah, thanks for the five steps. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, rapid fire questions. Let's go. Um, if you have a history of thyroid imbalance in your family, how do you best support your thyroid? Are there changes to steps above that you just mentioned, or do these steps change when you have an autoimmune condition of the thyroid? With autoimmune, it's a little bit of a different ballgame because you have to consider and factor in the autoimmune component first. So you do support your body in general. You have to still do all the work that we talked about, but you have to um, work with also like immune regulation. And I'm not saying immune suppression here because that is just middle ages. I'm sorry. 
it's called immune regulation so just to like make sure you support and regulate your immune system like for example there is a lot of controversy again <laughs> about echinacea and like you know there is this big talk about you know functional doctors say oh is the th1 pathway dominant or th2 pathway dominant and if your th2 pathway dominant echinacea is bad for you but no it's not true because from herbalists in like thousands of years of use of this herb we know that and i'm not a herbalist but i use it um Echinacea is an immune regulator, so that means it does support the, whichever part the immune system needs, and that includes both pathways. So just a tidbit there. So when um, you work with Hashimoto's, you have to seriously consider a bunch of other issues. Um, I would say if it comes, if it's in your family, like another big talk these days is like you know genetics, and everybody wants to have all these fancies genetic test done and then they're like oh my goodness i have this gene let's have my boobs cut off that is pretty insane to me because you guys remember there is such thing called gene expression and that comes from epigenetics which is a great new branch of studying that i love and i recommend everybody to get into epigenetics <laughs> it has a lot of answers but one of the main things that epigenetics tells us is that genes do not necessarily express. So, for example, in the case of thyroid or, you know, related to iodine, like in the family, you might have bad genetics when it comes to predisposition. But that does not necessarily mean you are going to get the same issues as your mother or your grandmother, you know, because you can just use nutrition to modulate, again, feed your, your body and with proper nutrition just make so that the DNA never needs to express certain genes versus others. So one word, you're healthy. You're not getting sick because you're healthy, you're well nourished, you're balanced, you know, you're eating well, you're keeping everything in check. So as far as what, you know, genetics is like nutrition prevention, nutrition is prevention. Totally amazing. And uh, the next question is, um, is it possible to go too low carb for too long and what effect does that have on our thyroid and our adrenals and our sex hormones? We've kind of touched on this, but I kind of want to drive that home. So I added that question again from another reader. <laughs> I just think that in general for the women's, for women metabolic systems and endocrine systems that going very, very low carb for a long time it's just not appropriate for our body. And honestly, what is the exact, you know, uh, physiological pathways of expression of that? Maybe I cannot tell you, but I've seen it and I've experienced it. And I just learned it from clinical practice, you know, seeing how it will really like, it's so much better to find your individual tolerance level and work with that instead of just ballpark, like 20 grams, everybody stay under 20 grams. That doesn't work. And for men, men have a very much simpler <sighs> hormonal profile. Yeah, I'm just like <laughs> sighing because my husband is just like, it's so simple for him. <laughs> men are in general like something, I don't know, like how did that happen? But, but you know what? I love being a woman and I wouldn't trade it for the world. So just saying that. <laughs> I know, but it's everything It's a little or a lot simpler for a yeah. man. So that... You know, um, for our hormonal picture, I really think that it's much more delicate and individual. And I really think that is better for us to work on individual basis. So that said, no, I don't think it's a good idea to go low carb for too low and too long. Amen. Uh, thyroid medications. So there's a bunch of questions on thyroid medications from my community. Um, what are the types of options? So if you are low thyroid and it's quite low and your doctor says um, you need to go on thyroid medication, what are the types of options and like what's the best and worst option? Okay, so I would say in general that thyroid medication has a place and that, that place is where the patient is so symptomatic that you can function. So it does bring relief and it's something that it can be used for a short period of time to really bring up the symptoms 
and like start kind of feeding the thyroid so or like supplying the hormones until the thyroid re restores and rebalances which is not always a quick process it might take months or it might take a year or it might take even longer so that i feel like it's the right place for thyroid medicine i there are some kind of medications that i really do not agree with and this is the synthetics because um when you learn like functional endocrinology you understand that hormones are very powerful and very delicate and when your gland is producing a hormone we call it upstream so and then produces these hormones that goes downstream into like a process of the body and you start introducing this hormone downstream so you're bringing in like a whole bunch of let's say t3 or t4 for the thyroid what happens to the thyroid what kind of signal does it get there is you know two mechanisms involved one is the negative feedback and the other one is also resistance so you know first of all when you you keep flooding the gland or your system with hormones and like it's like banging on something you know banging on your finger with a hammer your hammer will develop a callus eventually like you know it's gonna get all thick and damaged and it's not gonna even feel anything anymore or like if you keep screaming in somebody's ear they're gonna get deaf eventually so that's just the path like the process of becoming resistant to a hormone so when hormones are not strictly regulated or like you know the synthetic hormones are really not even recognized by the body so well the cells become resistant first of all which creates this bad really catch-22 situation where you need to produce more and more and with insulin is like the typical example then you become insulin resistant and I'm sure everybody has heard of that but guess what it happens with all hormones every single one of them and so T3 and T4 especially too uh, so that works on that level on the synthetic hormones and it also starts shutting down your thyroid because your thyroid keeps getting this negative feedback you don't need to make hormones there is plenty around so it sits there and waits and waits and waits and finally goes to sleep and then once it goes to sleep it starts you know maybe dying mm -hmm. you know it's like nobody needs me around here what am i here for <laughs> little shriveled up little raisin <laughs> Amazing. So it's just like your thyroid decides to leave you and become a monk and go move to town. <laughs> Amazing. And it doesn't become the shrine at the top of Everest. <laughs> you think eventually that's what happens. <laughs> Every little thyroid monk builds itself the shrine. <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> that is great. As you can see, we have a lot of fun talking together. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, it's a bit of a dry subject, you know. <laughs> so we'll add monks and Everest. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I totally love it. It needs to be made entertaining. So yeah, as far as the medication, I would say, if possible, stay away from the synthetics. Armor is the better option. It's just whole desiccated porcine thyroid. And so it goes in and brings both the hormones, but it also brings some of the nutrition because it's whole thyroid gland. So it has iodine in it, it has vitamin C in it, it has, you know, some minerals in it. By the way, like there is selenium, that's extremely important. There is iron, that's extremely important. We didn't even talk about anemia. Well, <laughs> you know, it's a complicated subject, but... Yeah, so what I would do is like, if your doctor really insists and you're very symptomatic, then maybe start with a whole desiccated and try to avoid being put on like, you know, any of this T3, T4 synthetic replacements. I which totally agree. Don't, yeah, and they don't heal your thyroid. They just do bad to the thyroid itself. So It's just patchwork and then another hole like blows out from your boat and then you have to deal with that, which gets patched up. I agree. And... And one thing actually that um, a lot of my clients have started doing as well as myself is you put the thyroid underneath your uh, tongue, like the thyroid <laughs> medication underneath your tongue, and then you let it dissolve until there's nothing left. Is that mm -hmm. something that you've worked with before? It just makes me think of neuro neurolingual response because, um, you know, we have... 
nervous terminals in the tongue that go straight to the brain. So they're really closely connected. They go from here just to your brain. And they communicate to the brain about what substance they're touching. So they're kind of prepare the body for whatever is coming in. And so it, it works, you know, like we do, for example, like muscle testing. A lot of times it's done with that because your body is already prepping for what is coming in. So you can just test something. I do like, for example, the coca pulse test for allergies or sensitivities. We do just put in stuff on the tongue sometimes. You don't even have to swallow it and it will start racing your heart. So I feel like, yeah, there is a lot of sense to that and it will start working because your body is already like, hey, we got stuff coming this in. This is happening. Yeah, let's okay. do it. Okay, cool. Okay, and like thyroid medications too. Are there interactions with them? Like I know, um, for instance, there's you shouldn't be taking calcium or iron, iron or like digestive things like antacids and stuff while you are taking thyroid medication or within, I think it's like four hours or two hours of your medication. Are there yeah, foods that you sure. shouldn't be eating? Yeah. I, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm not sure because I don't work with the medication unless my patients are on them. Okay, I can totally answer this question. So <laughs> you probably know a ton more about that. Oh, that's fine. Um, so cabbage, uh, collards, fenugreek is one, especially if you're a breastfeeding mom and you're on thyroid, like fenugreek, because you're probably on fenugreek then. Um, flax is one. Uh, there's also kale. St. John wort, St. John's wort rather, and uh, kelp, kelp, yeah, which is interesting, like yeah, yeah, so don't take kelp or iodine too close to your thyroid medication, because it could throw off um, your yeah. pills, so usually, but if you have it dissolved underneath your tongue, it's going to hit your body a lot quicker, and mm -hmm. usually it's about like an hour or two, and then you can have like all of those things, and rotate it too, like I wouldn't sit down and have like a huge bowl of cabbage, <laughs> for breakfast um I have done that so that is why I say that um and <laughs> and we kind of talked about the side effects of thyroid medications like if you do the you know the synthetic synthroid type thing it's going to cause a lot more issues um if you're taking too high a dose of thyroid medications you can um your me your metabolism can get a little bit wonky I know that um mm -hmm. so um, how do you know when your thyroid meds are working? Um, a good way, I know that take your temperature is a good one. Yeah, that's like, a good one, yes. Track your temperature before you even move in the morning or <laughs> like right before bed. Like before you, I keep a thermometer underneath my pillow and I literally like turn over very slowly, grab it and stick it in my mouth. Um, <laughs> I've tried underneath my armpit, but I don't get an accurate reading underneath no, my armpit I ever. I do under the tongue also is much better. Yes. Yeah. And always, I always do the same side. So it's like as accurate as possible. Same time. Like I wake up at the same time every day, test then. And yeah. Then before and I go to bed. Like what I yes. have my patients do, I do a little bit different temperature test because I do another test that averages temperatures and it shows you both adrenal and thyroid function. But yeah, like it's great to chart it because then you start seeing like how it goes up and down and where it is and how it flattens out. So yeah, that's a great tip. Awesome. And last question is goitrogens. Are they real? Is it actually a thing? <laughs> yes, they are real. Okay. Um, and there are such things as goitrogen foods. But I got to say this, that even if you have thyroid issues, it's okay to eat your kale and your cabbage. You just have to like not go crazy on it, you know. So my indication is like one to maximum two portions a day of a go any goitrogen food. Like if you want to eat cabbage or broccoli or Brussels sprouts, and I don't remember all of them, but, you know, no more than like two portions a day. So And, and do they get inactive or like lessen the impact when they're cooked? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So, like, you know, it's better to have them cook when you do have thyroid issues. Um, but, you know, if you have, like, one arugula salad a week, you're not going to tip it overboard, you know. And especially if you are doing all the good nutrition and you're taking your iodine and, you know, all the vitamins and minerals and everything else we talked about, then the goitrogen is really, like, minimally impacting. Yeah, totally. So, as to be taken in perspective. 
That's amazing. Well, those are all the questions that I had. Oh my gosh, that like wow. I feel like we aced the thyroid topic, right? We scratched the thyroid. <laughs> yeah, like scratched the total surface, like one grain of sand on like a huge beach. But for like for people that want to know more information about thyroid and especially when it comes to low carbohydrate, and I love that we talked about the fact that too low carb for too long for women, I don't feel is a good idea. I did that. Um, cause I was silly and thought like, if I just push harder, it will do a bunch of awesome things, but it did a bunch of not so awesome things. And right. thankfully I caught it soon enough, but I've been working with clients who have been like 20, uh, not even 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrates for six months. Ouch. Uh, and then, uh, just like a whole world of issues. So I hope that the information that we shared, um, and thank you so much, Vivica. Oh my gosh, you know so much about this topic. So I'm so happy that we had you on the show. I feel like I, I just scratched the surface and I still have like books and courses and things that need to be done. And, but it's constant learning, you know, so it's all right. Totally. And for those just looking to heal their bodies, I feel like we gave a lot of good information to people that are just like, I just need help. And that's really where it comes from because I'm sure something that you said will spark uh, something in someone and they'll go searching off and that's really what it's all about and that's why we do this is so that people can really put their health into their own hands and like get balanced and awesome and I'll include all of your links below this video back on my blog below the YouTube video so you guys can check it out and go visit and say hello and uh, thank you so much for being on the show and we will chat soon thank you so much Leah. bye here. bye bye <laughs> thanks bye, bye.